key in all of our lives and unlocks huge potential when we walk in it. The homework Jason gave us, listen Esther, was twofold. One was to thank someone who has been instrumental in your life in the past. And two, in an issue that you've been wrestling with for a long time, Instead of continuing to wrestle with it, start to thank God for how he's going to work it out. Thank him for how he's going to change things and then release it to him. This homework was extremely practical for me this week. I loved it. Two weeks ago, before I knew that Jason was going to speak on the Grateful Heart topic, I was praying about a certain situation and I sensed the Holy Spirit whisper, Start to thank me for what I'm going to do. I love it when God leads and prepares my heart in such a clear and direct way. I've spent a lot of time soaking in the topic of gratitude this week, and so today's message is entitled, A Lifestyle of Gratitude. My scriptural foundation is from Philippians 4, which Jason used last week. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The topic of gratitude sounds so biblical, and it certainly is. There are a hundred verses in the Bible that talk about giving thanks. It is a foundational teaching and a core spiritual discipline. As I researched this topic this week, I discovered that the gratitude message is being taught in many different arenas of life, not just in church settings. The journey of digging deeper into this topic began about four years ago when I came across a book called 1,000 Gifts by Anne Voskamp with a subtitle that said, a dare to live fully right where you are. This grabbed my attention. Anne is a farmer's wife from Ontario and is a very gifted writer and speaker. Her website is aholyexperience.com. She has several blogs per week and then a weekend edition that's called Multivitamins for Your Weekend. Awesome stuff. Anyways, at first, I didn't connect with her picturesque and poetic style, but I pushed through that, and I've now read the book three times. A paragraph on the inside of her cover says, A beautiful, practical guide to living a life of joy, 1,000 Gifts invites you to wake up to God's everyday blessings. As Anne Voskamp discovered, in giving thanks for the life she already had, she found the life she always wanted. Her grace-bathed reflections on farming and parenting will help you with a transformative spiritual discipline. Along the way, you will discover a way of seeing that opens your eyes to gratitude, a way of living so you are not afraid to die, and a way of becoming present to God's presence that brings deep and lasting happiness. The title 1,000 Gifts came from a challenge that she felt God give to her in writing down 1,000 things that she was grateful for. So she started a gratitude journal. She never would have guessed how this simple exercise was part of transforming her life and would eventually lead her to writing this book. Even though I've been challenged with this topic for years and have experienced some heart revelation, I can honestly say that I didn't dive in until this past week. And it certainly was kick-started by Jason's challenge last week about looking at an issue that we've been wrestling with for a while, and now was the time to start thanking God. I just felt the Holy Spirit saying, Joan, now is the time to choose to be more intentional with a spiritual discipline of thanksgiving. And so last night, in a beautiful journal given to me by a precious friend, I started my gratitude journal. Gratitude means thankfulness, counting your blessings, noticing simple pleasures, and acknowledging everything that you receive. 
It means learning to live your life as if everything were a miracle and being aware on a continuous basis of how much you've been given. Gratitude shifts your focus from what your life lacks to the abundance that is already present. Research has shown the surprising life improvements that can stem from the practice of gratitude. Giving thanks makes people happier and more resilient. It strengthens relationships, it improves health, and it reduces stress. Two psychologists, Michael McCullo of Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas, and Robert Emmons of the University of California at Davis, wrote an article about an experiment they conducted on gratitude and its impact on well-being. The study split several hundred people into three different groups and all of the participants were asked to keep daily diaries. The first group kept a diary of the events that occurred during the day without being told specifically to write about either good or bad things. The second group was told to record their unpleasant experiences. And the last group was instructed to make a daily list of things for which they were, were grateful. The results of the study indicated that daily gratitude exercises resulted in higher reported levels of alertness, enthusiasm, determination, optimism, and optimism, and energy. In addition, those in the gratitude group experienced less depression and stress, were more likely to help others, exercised more regularly, and made greater progress toward achieving personal goals. Dr. Emmons, who has been studying gratitude for almost 10 years, is the author of the book, Thanks, How the New Science of Gratitude Can Make You Happier. The information in this book is based on research involving thousands of people conducted by a number of different researchers around the world. One of the things these studies show is that practicing gratitude can increase happiness levels by around 25%. The age-old principle that comes straight from the scriptures is being recognized as powerful and being taught all over the world. How cool is that? I want to tell you a little story this morning about my friends from South Africa, Bob and Nikki Fuller. Bob and I were part of a group of seven people that ventured into the unknown world of South Africa in January of 1988. Bob grew up in Iowa, just a few states over to the south. We had been given some information about what program we were joining, but as we discovered, there was so much we did not know, and it was definitely a journey of discovery, one with many joys and many tough times. Bob and I have a few things in common with our South African journeys. We both led teams in our second and third year with Youth for Christ. We both married South Africans, and Bob and Nikki led the YFC team program after Gavin and myself had led it for two years. We've been good friends ever since we embarked on our first adventure 26 years ago. Bob and Nikki worked for Youth for Christ until 2004, and then they started full-time with the King's School, a private Christian school for 450 students, grades 1 to 12. Bob became the head of student affairs in October 2004. Both Bob and Nikki are presently involved in the senior management of the school and continue to be involved in many aspects of the school. We spent a day with them when we traveled over to South Africa as a family in January of 2006. It was five months later that Bob was diagnosed with motor neuron disease, also known as ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. I called Nikki this week and asked her to share the timeline of their journey because at that time he was given two to five years to live, and this is now eight years later. Here's what she said. It started by him not feeling that his body was doing what he wanted it to do. Then he started to struggle to hold a pen properly. After his diagnosis in July of 2006, there was a general weakness 
but he had his first bad fall seven months later. By then the muscles in his hands were weakening too, so he stopped driving. Gradually he started walking with a stick, then a walker. He then was given a motorized scooter with his, which his hands could still manage the controls. Then he got a motorized wheelchair, which he could also still drive. But eventually he couldn't drive that himself either. All of this time, his speech was deteriorating as well as his ability to chew and swallow. Speech stopped completely by about 2009, which was about the same time we had a feeding tube inserted. Liquids choke him completely, so in all this time, since the feeding tube, no liquid has passed his lips. He still manages some porridge and pureed food because it is easier to control going down his throat. Currently, he can do nothing for himself. Thankfully, he can still support his weight for very sh short periods, but this, means we can sh but this means we can shift him into the van and onto the bed and do not have to physically lift him. His neck can still support his head, but he struggles terribly with headaches from the strain. At the moment, he is struggling with a lot of mucus on the lungs. In order for it not to become infected, the physiotherapist has to suction it out through a pipe down his throat. Very difficult to watch. The bis biggest danger to M and D ALS sufferers is when the muscles needed to breathe stop working. Bob decided from the start that he would trust God completely in this and has chosen to concentrate on what still works rather than on what doesn't. When asked how he remains so positive, he said that the alternative does not bear thinking about. Nikki also mentioned before that she has never heard a word of complaint in eight years. He has two full-time workers helping him, one for the day and one for the night. Bob still goes to work every day from 7 a.m. to 2 p.m. He is still the head of student affairs, and he works with the team around him. For many years, he had a device attached to the center of his glasses, which would allow him to communicate using the computer. Currently, he uses a different device that calibrates with his eyes. He locks onto a letter with his eyes, and he slowly can type a sentence in that way. I was able to spend some time with them when I went over in 2011. I had not seen him since this disease started, and so it was a very difficult emotional visit that I had. Many fundraisers have been done, as you can well imagine all the costs with wheelchairs, vehicles, ramps, etc., and they don't have the kind of medical um, system that we have here in Canada. Many people from their church have done 40-day fasts. Many people around the world are praying for Bob. They attribute his miraculous life to the power of God at work. People have been so faithful to pray and encourage. This July will be eight years since Bob was diagnosed. They are believing for God's healing and are resting in his timing. The short video that we will watch was filmed two years ago. It was aired on the South African National News. Their friend Jolene took two months to run from Cape Town to Johannesburg to raise awareness of MND. You will see Bob communicating in the video using the device on his glasses. Also one other note, Nikki uses the term SMS in the video, which in our language means text messages. So let's roll with the video now. In the footsteps of the woman who marched to the Union buildings back in 1956, Jolene Perkins ran across the country to raise awareness around motor neuron disease. Running across South Africa, a crazy adventure, thought-provoking, enough time to just think about things, running through the Karoo especially where there's just absolutely nothing. <laughs> it's been a stunning, a stunning run. I'm running for motor neuron disease. I have a very close friend, Bob, who has, who was diagnosed with motor neuron disease five, six years ago. I decided it was time to give back. Yeah, I just sent out a message and the message was just to challenge those who can actually do things with their body. They should do it. 
Motor neuron disease attacks the nerve cells responsible for basic activities like walking, speaking, swallowing and breathing. Diagnosed in 2006, Bob Fuller was given a very poor prognosis. Soon after my diagnosis, I identified what I call the big five physical challenges of MND. The fifth, and maybe the most frustrating physical challenge, has been communication. Two of the first things I lost were the ability to hold a pen and to type on a computer keyboard. I then lost the ability to use a mouse, so I got the head mouse that I'm using now. For me, the two most difficult challenges of living with MND are how it has affected Nikki and what it has stolen from our relationship. We still manage to communicate and often laugh together. I'll let her tell you about the most recent incident. <laughs> I had been receiving SMSs um, from an, a very long number that I didn't recognize. But they were very cheesy pickup lines. So I thought, well, if this continues, I'm going to have to go to the police. Fortunately, I, uh, one evening I got one and I just blurted out. I said, Bob, I'm so terribly worried, but I'm getting these SMSs. Oh. <laughs> well, unbeknown to me is that he was trying out this new software. <laughs> and so these cheesy SMSs were coming from Bob. Bob's sense of humor hasn't changed. He's still Bob. And um, you know, as much as it's taken so much from us, um, you know, it's amazing how you can remain close, regardless. I want to say how grateful Nikki and I are to Jolene and everyone else involved in making the run possible. It's gone a long way toward raising awareness of the disease. And hopefully, it will communicate to those living with MND the positive message that they are not running this race alone and that they can continue this journey in spite of the difficulties along the way. Through this brave two-month journey, Jolene has impacted thousands of people. The response people had was, like, thank you for letting us know. We've never heard of it. Um, obviously, they've heard of Just Fun of Essays and Who Has It? And that's kind of, they never knew what it was, what it entailed. So just sharing, you know, what, what happens to the body and just sharing messages like that was, um, yeah, it was very, very fulfilling, yeah. Probably carry on with the campaign, really, just you know, in support of MND. They need a lot of help. They really do. Um, I think there's only three or four people in the association, so and there's so many people with, that are diagnosed with MND. So I'm going to try and do whatever I can. Rose, following in the footsteps of the woman who marched to the. As I was preparing this message, I really felt that God wanted to use this story this morning. I sent them a note asking for permission to speak about them and also asked if the discipline of gratitude was one that had been important on their journey. And that's how it started. As I was preparing my message, it was like just contact Bob and Nikki and ask them the question. And I want to read you her response. She says, Amazing that you asked that. I have had many really low times over the past eight years. And every time God has used something specific to teach me to overcome that specific low. About three years ago, a friend gave me the book, 1000 Gifts by Anne Voskamp. She had no idea, by the way, that I was going to be using that as well in my message. She says it was a lifesaver. She writes that the fall of man was and always will be that we are not satisfied with what God gives. We want something more, something other. For me, especially when our future was full of dreams and hopes and now was just a blank sheet before me, I knew God was in control. I knew he allowed this for his glory. I knew his grace is sufficient, yet I struggled. Anne Voskamp writes that in the story of the ten lepers who were healed by Jesus, only one returned to thank Jesus. Jesus said to him, Rise and go, your faith has made you well. But he was already healed. What did Jesus mean? The Greek word there is sozo, which means true wellness, complete wholeness. The man was already physically healed, but he received sozo, 
saving into a full whole life when he returned and gave thanks. When Bob receives his healing, and I have not received sozo, then this trial for me has lost its meaning. And I can only do that by living a life of thanksgiving. It has changed my life. I still fail in this, but the lesson helps me get up again. And when I am thankful, and I sometimes have to force myself to be, my hope returns and my attitude changes. What a story. Thank you, Bob and Nikki, for letting me share your story. I know that it's touched us. And we will pray together with you and many others for God's sustaining grace and healing in your lives. The message on a lifestyle of gratitude will challenge each one of us in different ways. Maybe for you it's in the area of finances. For me, it's wanting to see change in other people and knowing that my most powerful prayer is to thank God for how He is going to change the people I love. Maybe for you it's your health. We all have a different area where we need to turn to thanksgiving. You were given a bookmark when you came, came in this morning. I love that Jason, uh, one of his trademarks is giving homework, and so I took that from him today as well. Your homework for this week is to take that bookmark and to write three things each day that you are grateful for. Maybe this is the time for you to start a gratitude journal. As we are empowered by the Holy Spirit, he will lead us and guide us in all that we do. My prayer is that he will use the words spoken this morning to bring spirit-filled, life-changing, positive things into all of our lives as we head into this new week. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you so much for your touch on our lives here this morning. Lord, without you, we are nothing. We need you, Lord. We are so desperate for you and dependent on you, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would, by your Holy Spirit, you would take the words spoken this morning and that you would water those words, that you would cause them to bear fruit this week, Lord, in all of our lives. I pray, Lord, that you would bless Bob and Nikki. Lord, you know the difficult, very difficult journey that they are on. And Lord, I ask that you would sustain them. Lord, that you would pour out your grace and your mercy on them, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for their, their walk with you and their, their shining example of following you with everything that they are. Jesus, I pray that your anointing would fall, Lord, on this message of thanksgiving, that you would bring fresh revelation. Lord, as we walk the walk of gratitude, as we as we journey in this and as we need you, Holy Spirit, we need your infilling, Lord, to, to have that joy that comes, and we need you for that. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to remain seated as we um, sing the song that we sang at the beginning of my message. And um, when we finish singing it, we're just going to spend just a couple minutes in quiet and just um, soak what, what the Lord is doing. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I My righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Jesus, thank you for your touch on us this morning. And Lord, as we go, I pray, Lord, your blessing on each person. Lord, thank you that you have us. You have us in the palm of your hand, Lord. Thank you for your mercy and your kindness. Jesus, we love you. In your name.